edition of Chat Night Africa Live from Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. He went to the hospital for routine colonoscopy and never woke up. What happened? It can happen to you. That's why you should pay attention to the content of this broadcast. What exposes you to colon cancer attack what happens now you get diagnosed with colon cancer what next these questions and more on this broadcast and to take your questions i have somebody very very knowledgeable as i told you he graduated from one of the best medical schools on the entire planet i'm talking about dr ivo dita I am talking about Mayo Clinic in the United States. Thank you for joining us on this show this week. Right away, ladies and gentlemen, we will get in touch. With Dr. Ivo Dita, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Hello, Dr. Dita. Welcome to Hello, Channel Africa Live. Uh, good, good evening, uh, Divine. It's my pleasure to be here once more. We are talking about colon cancer, and as you told me, this month is very special when this disease is concerned. Tell us a little bit about it before we start with the questions. Yeah, uh, the month of March is uh, actually uh, known uh, for being the colon cancer uh, awareness month uh, in the United States. So uh, during this month, we as uh, gastroenterologists uh, actually go out to talk to the communities and educate our, our masses or the general population on the importance of uh, screening for colon cancer. Uh, so because as uh, you well know, uh, Divine, uh, colon cancer is best managed when diagnosed early. So hopefully during this program, uh, we're gonna cover uh, the several aspects of uh, colon cancer in a way that uh, enhances or empowers uh, our people or the general population to be more aware and to make sure they take care of their colon health. 
Dr. Dieter, the question already burning a hole in my pocket is this. What is colon cancer? What part of the body does colon cancer attack? Yeah, I think it's uh, very important that we secrete uh, ourselves before we move into the broadcast. Uh, again, we're just going to uh, keep it very simple so that the general population can understand. So in the human body, we have uh, the, the digestive system, which starts from the mouth uh, to the anus. Uh, you have the esophagus, which is the food pipe. And then your stomach, which connects to your small intestines, where most of your ingredients uh, 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 and nutrients are absorbed. And then uh, beyond the small intestine, it's the colon, or what we generally call uh, the large intestines. So colon cancer uh, primarily uh, or specifically uh, affects the colon. Uh, so that's the part that connects your small intestine to your anus. So uh, that's a part of the body which is concerned uh, with colon cancer. Um, the colon is about uh, four to five feet uh, long. Uh, but fortunately enough, uh, uh, with medical technology and advances, uh, we've been able to come up with techniques that we can completely examine that part of your body and screen or identify things which you may not actually be aware that they are going on uh, in order to uh, 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 prevent downstream uh, die consequences such as developing colon cancer. Now, there are all kinds of cancers, I understand. There's colon cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, liver cancer, throat cancer, brain cancer, bone cancer, blood cancer. Oh, I mean, just a legion of cancers. I'm going to ask you the question again, which I'm sure many people have on their minds. What just happens that all of a sudden, that part that connects your small intestines to the anus becomes a target? What, what, what happens in the body? Uh, yeah, so Divine, before uh, I answer your question, I want to uh, actually take a step back and make sure your, uh, uh, our audience understands the importance of colon cancer. Why are we talking about colon cancer? Uh, colon cancer is the, is the third most commonly diagnosed cancer in the United States. So this is not one of those rare cancers like pancreatic cancer that we spoke about last week. Generally, we estimate the incidence, meaning new cases of colon cancer diagnosed in a given period of time at about 40,000 cases occurring in 100,000 people. So out of every 100,000 people, about 40 uh, of them will develop uh, 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 colon cancer. Now, mortality is also very important. Among all those that uh, are diagnosed with colon cancer, approximately 14 out of every 100,000 will die from colon cancer. So this is not uh, something uh, that we take lightly. We take colon cancer uh, very importantly, and that's how I want the audience or everybody watching today to consider this uh, problem. Now, I know people are going to be asking, you ask the question, why of a sudden it attacks the colon? As physicians, we often focus uh, both on health promotion before prevention and then curative or diagnostic and curative medicine. So it's very important uh, that uh, we talk about some of the factors uh, which we consider as risk factors, which may put people at an increased risk of colon cancer. To start with, we know that the incidence or the development of colon cancer is higher in men. Unfortunately, this is not a factor you and I can change. Just for the fact that you are a man, you are at higher risk of developing colon cancer. People seem to think that there is some hormonal role. The male hormones may play a role in this. Unfortunately, all these things are controversial. Most of the things I'm going to tell you 
there's no uh, uh, gold standard or it hasn't been completely shown that there is a cause and effect relationship. But we know that those factors certainly have often been found in people that get diagnosed with colon cancer. So there is an association. It's not a cause effect, but there is certainly an association between those factors and the development of colon cancer. So that's the first factor. Simply, simply being a man puts you at a higher risk of colon cancer. The other thing we talk about is race and ethnicity. We know that African Americans are at increased risk of colon cancer compared to, their, to the other races. That's why the, uh, 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 the United States uh, uh, Preventive Service uh, Task Force and uh, the gastroenterological associations have actually made the recommendation that for African Americans, screening for colon cancer should start at the age of 45 rather than the usual 50 years. Because we know that African Americans develop cancer earlier and they often come in with more aggressive disease and at a more advanced stage. So it's very important that if you are an African American, colon cancer screening begins at the age of 45. And I want you to take this information and inform all your family members, your friends, who may not be aware that they should start screening for colon cancer at the age of 45. So you've heard me talk about age. Age is certainly one of the strongest known factors in terms of incident colon cancer. As I already pointed out, no, um, for non-Hispanic blacks, or for if you're not an African-American, colon cancer screening starts at the age of 50. And we know that with increasing age, the likelihood you are, more, the, the, you are more at increased risk of developing colon cancer, which is why we started at that, at that age. We know that the difference, the sex difference between men and women remains, the incidence remains higher in men compared to women, even across all age groups. So it's very important. And we do also know that we are recognizing an increase in the number of cancer cases identified in younger people. So it's very important that people go get screening at the recommended age. The other thing I want to talk about is whether could you blame your parents for your risk of colon cancer. I was going to ask you, um, what exposes people to, uh, I mean, to being attacked by colon, colon cancer? Yes. So, uh, and I think that's a very appropriate question. And we know that some people, there are some hereditary forms of colon cancer. We will not go into the details. But there is something we call Lynch syndrome. There is something we call FAP or familiar adenomatous polyposis syndrome, which all puts you at risk of colon cancer. And these people, actually, you have, it's a genetic defect that you probably were born with. And we have diagnostic criteria based on your family tree. For example, for Lynch syndrome, we are looking for involvement of about three individuals, at least two generations, and, uh, and cancer onset before the age of 50. And once you have a candidate like that, you send them for a genetic test, which may identify some of the defects that puts them at a higher risk of colon cancer. So those individuals actually do not fall into what we call the average risk group for colon cancer. So they will start screening so at the age of about 13 to 20. So that, that is important to remember. The other thing is, are there any dietary factors 
or some environmental factors that put you at increased risk of colon cancer. Again, what I'm going to tell you is not cause and effect, but some association that has been noticed, and we in the medical community recognize them. For example, increased animal fat, for example, a lot of red meat, has been associated with an increase in the incidence of colon cancer. People that eat less, consume less fruits, do not eat enough vegetables, have also been shown to have an increased risk of developing colon cancer. Obesity, meaning again a BMI of greater than 30, and the BMI again is equal to your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. If that is greater than 30, then you are also considered to be at increased risk of colon cancer. The other factor is smoking. Smoking has also been associated. I mean, people that uh, watched the talk on pancreatic cancer last week will remember that we talked a lot about smoking and also about obesity. But the bottom line is we know there is an association between these factors and your risk of developing colon cancer. So for now, I think uh, 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 if, every, if, if our audience can remember these factors that I just described, then you, have, uh, uh, you are set to go. And you can certainly inform and educate everyone in your environment, in your groups, in your family regarding their risk of colon cancer. Again, today we will focus on average risk. We're not going to be talking about those people that have the hereditary syn syndromes that we just discussed, but I think it was important to mention those. I'm going to ask you a question about uh, lifestyle in association with uh, uh, colon cancer. I notice, and everybody notices, you're not talking about causation, cause effect. Um, why is that? Generally, people don't take action if they don't realize that something A causes B. Why are you in the medical field not talking about cause effect? You're talking about associated with this. What explains it? From an epidemiological perspective, cause effect relationships are very difficult to prove. I can cite to you, for example, we know smoking causes lung cancer of course with but as you know not every person that smokes develops colon cancer so there are other several factors that interplay with the smoking to cause colon cancer to cause lung cancer i'm sorry that's one of the main things in medicine that has been established like a cause effect now when we so a, to say a factor is causal we have a different standard or threshold that that factor needs to meet before it can be called a causal factor. Association, the, the factor or the threshold to reach is most, much less compared to a causal factor. And that's why when the evidence, when the strength of the association is not extremely convincing or strong, or we do not understand the direct mechanism by which that factor causes that effect, we hesitate to call it the causal effect. In epidemiology, there are actually nine factors, they call them the Bradford Hill criteria, that we use to determine whether a factor is causal for an entity or not. For example, if I take the cholera, uh, 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 the vibro cholera that causes cholera, and give you that will cause cholera. That is something you cannot question. You can, that uh, it has a causal and effect relationship. But dirty water, if, I, if you drink dirty water in, a, let me say, in an area where there is one or two people with, 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 uh, cholera, you are at an increased risk. We are not saying water is causal 
for cholera. But we know dirty water is associated or you, you are at increased risk of developing cholera, especially in an environment where there is uh, one or two people that have suffered from cholera. So again, it's more an epidemiological ter terminology, cause effect, as opposed to an association with uh, an effect. This is Chat Night Africa Life, and connecting from the great state of Minnesota is Dr. Ivo Dita. He is explaining things about or related to why you should pay attention to colon cancer, something you should not ignore or neglect. Now, how do you detect colon cancer? What are the clinical signs of colon, colon cancer? How do I know that I have it if I didn't go to the doctor? Are this? Am I going to sleep and have a headache at night, or I lose appetite, or I get grumpy or grouchy? What happens? What are the clinical signs of? I think this is a very important question, Divine. And the reason being that, as you know, we talk about screening. The concept of screening in epidemiology applies to diseases that remain silent for a very long time, before they become clinically evident. What that implies is, even though you and I are walking out there and feeling great, there may be something in you that is brewing, and by the time a symptom shows up, it's at a stage that we cannot do much about it. So it often presents itself at late stages, and that's why screening as a concept applies to diseases that start at, that are asymptomatic at onset and only show themselves up after a certain length of time. But we understand with colon cancer, we know that colon cancer develops from something called polyps. And polyps are abnormal growths that develop in your colon. And as we discussed we know age is the strongest factor. And as you get older, the, the likelihood of developing a polyp increases. So this polyp usually takes about 10 years to finally develop into a cancer. So what we try to do is see if we can catch those people who are developing polyps within that period before it becomes cancer. And during that period, trust me, a majority, we talk of a huge proportion of these individuals have absolutely no symptoms. That's the pre-cancer stage. Now, when you have developed cancer, what kind of symptoms can you have? If you have a, we just look at, so you're looking at your colon, it's a tube. Cancers, if you have a cancer, that is that big and blocks the tube, you can present with a bowel obstruction. If that cancer infiltrates the walls of your colon, you may start developing some abdominal discomfort, some abdominal pain. Now, cancers bleed a lot. So a lot of times, it may be a patient that your doctor just did a blood test and found out that your hemoglobin is low. And then he's like, where is this patient bleeding? Maybe we have to check and make sure there is nothing growing in their colon. And then you will get a colonoscopy. Other symptoms, some people may develop, uh, as I noted, bloody diarrhea, frank blood. So those that we identify with the blood test that have anemia, they may actually tell you, doc, my stools are all normal. I have no problem. But then their blood tests are showing anemia that suggests a bleeding, what we call a microcytic or iron deficiency anemia. And then we start querying you more. And then we come to say, oh, perhaps this symptom suggests a colon issue. And then we go to check in your colon. Some patients, if, if the tumor is that big and it's blocking your colon, before you develop a complete bowel obstruction, you may become constipated. So constipation is one of the things. Again, nine, about 90 to 95% of people that have constipation, is it due to a colon cancer? No. 
But can colon cancer have constipation? Yes. So I don't want your audience to walk away from here saying that, oh, Dr. Dida say if you have constipation, it's colon cancer. No, that's not what I'm saying. Another thing that I want to point out is a change in the caliber of your stool. Something we describe as pencil stools. Usually, again, uh, we're very figurative here. Your people's stool come out pro uh, of maybe something of this size. And then just of a sudden, because the tumor is taking up space, that, is, that uh, uh, lumen becomes narrow, and the stool now comes out almost like a, a tiny, a thinny, pencil-like stool. So if you also notice that kind of a change, it's important to check out with your doctor to make sure that this is not a, a, a colon cancer. Now, if the cancer is very advanced, and develops what we call metastasis. Meaning, the cancer has left the colon and it has gone to another organ. For example, your liver. It can also go to your lungs. Then patients may also show up with other symptoms, for example, liver-related symptoms or, or, or a cough. And by the time they do an x-ray, they see something in there. They say, oh, where did this come from? And by checking, they can go back to your colon. But that's late stage disease. And at that stage uh, there is very little except uh, for chemotherapy that patients can get. We don't want patients to get to that age. That's why screening or preventive colonoscopy or again I keep talking about colonoscopy. There are other options for screening for colon cancer which hopefully we will get to should be done once you get to that age. So, uh, uh, that, so again, defined to summarize, before the cancer stage, patients have what we call polyps. And polyps are the things that will grow into the cancer. When you have a polyp, most often than not, you do not have any symptom. You're going about, you're playing, you're eating, everything is great. So most patients have no symptoms. And when you start presenting with symptoms, most often than not, your disease is at an advanced stage. We do not want people to wait until that time. We want people to come to us when it's time so we can screen you and make sure you do not develop cancer. But if you develop any of those symptoms I mentioned, please, without any delay, you should meet with your, with your primary care provider and talk more about this. Dr. Dieter, I'm sure this Cameroonian in Maryland did not want to wait. And so one good morning, he went with his wife to see the doctor for routine colonoscopy, not because he was feeling any discomfort, not because there was any physical sign or there were any physical signs that pointed to the fact that he could have colon cancer. He went on the advice, I presume, of his physician, like you're advising us. This guy went and just never woke up. So I'm sure people have been waiting for this question and waiting for your answer. What may have happened? What happens that somebody goes for a routine colonoscopy and just doesn't survive? Good. Um, fine. We will certainly talk about uh, the side effects or perhaps the complications of a colonoscopy. But before we do that, I'd like to take a small step back to talk about the options that we have available for screening for colon cancer. So there are several options that we can use to screen for colon cancer. One of, uh, you can actually divide them into two main groups. One of the groups is what we call the stool-based non-invasive screening options. And the other group, you can call them endoscopic screening options. We, I know we can also today use CT scans imaging to screen for colon cancer, but that is, is, an, is, an, is an option only when the other options do not work as it stands in the United States today. So the stool or the non-invasive options involves the doctor ordering the test for you and you receive a kit and you supply your stool to the lab 
and they look for certain markers inside that may suggest that there is something going on in you, in, in, in the polyps. And most often than not, patients that have advanced polyps. Again, polyps, we can classify them into low-risk and high-risk polyps. And high-risk polyps are those that, of course, are closer to becoming a cancer. And they are polyps that are bigger than one centimeter in size. They are polyps that when we look under the microscope, they have what we call high-grade dysplasia, meaning they have a lot of changes which make them closer to becoming a cancer than not. And there is one other future which we call tubulovillus adenomas. Again, I don't want to confuse your audience, but those three factors will make a polyp that is identified to be considered a high-risk adenoma or not. Adenomas are polyps that have the potential to grow into a cancer. And so when we take out the polyp, we classify them into those two groups. Those two base tests are more likely to pick up those polyps that I'm describing as high-risk adenomas. Some of them, you need to do them on an annual basis. There is one that, called, uh, that also is based on stool testing that you can do every three years. Again, your doctor can discuss these options with you. Apart from the stool option is the endoscopic option. We have a flexible sigmoidoscopy. I mean, I told you your colon is probably about 450 to 600 centimeters in length. That's how long it is. But patients can have what we call a flexible sigmoidoscopy, which only goes about 60 centimeters. That's an option. That is also uh, allowed in the United States to screen for colon cancer. That only sees the left side of your colon to about 40 to 60 centimeters. That test is supposed to be done every five years. If that's the option you choose. The other option is now the colonoscopy. And the colonoscopy goes and sees the entire colon. And if you do a colonoscopy and you do not have any polyp, then you come back in another 10 years. Of course, the intervals at which you come back for, uh, for to repeat these tests will depend on whether you had a polyp, how many polyps you had, and how those polyps looked under the microscope, and what is the size of the polyp. Remember the factors I cited that make a polyp a high-risk polyp. Based on those, on size, how it looks under the microscope, the number, we will determine the interval at which you need to come back. It may be in three years, it may be in five years, it may be in 10 years, it may be in less than three years. Now, for the non-invasive tests that I first described, which are the two based tests, if, when you have those, and you identify to have to test positive, then you have to undergo a diagnostic test, which is the colonoscopy. So people who are really afraid of going straight to the colonoscopy often go for the stool-based testing. And when they have a polyp or they, they test positive, then they move on to do a colonoscopy. I, I, sitting here, I can tell you that the colonoscopy is often regarded as almost the best existing option. Why? Because we go in, we can see better, and we can take out the poly once we see it. The stool-based tests are good to be approved for screening, but they have the, 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 they are more likely to miss on certain polyps as compared to the colonoscopy. But the, the miss rate is not that high, and that's why it's allowed as a screening option for colon cancer. So those are the many options that we have. Now, if we try to do a colonoscopy and we are not able to complete it, maybe because the patient's colon is very twisted, the patient's colon is, has restricted mobility, which we can see in patients that have had uh, multiple surgeries in their belly, uh, likely in patients that are older, 
then and we are not able to complete that colonoscopy then we are forced to stop and we can send those patients to get an imaging study called a CT colonography. But again, if that shows that you have a polyp, you will, we have to take out that polyp. And how do we have, we will either have to go back and try the colonoscopy again. And if that fails and that polyp is very concerning, then you may end up having surgery to go have the polyp removed. And even when we do colonoscopy, it's important for the audience to know we can identify polyps that we cannot take out right there endoscopically. And in those patients, sometimes we are still forced to refer them to have surgery. Now, so you ask the question on, on complications of colonoscopy. Yes, can colonoscopy uh, lead to death? Yes. How often does it happen? The chance is less than 0.0001%. So when I talk to my patients before a colonoscopy, there are several factors that we talk about. I start by telling my patient, this test is very safe. And for sure, it's a very safe test. But there are some risks that I explain to every patient. The first thing I tell my patients is the risk of bleeding. And this is the most common complication of a colonoscopy. And the risk is higher in patients that we take out polyps, and especially if the polyps are very big. And the, 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 the probability or the risk of bleeding from a colonoscopy it's about eight patients out of 10,000. So eight colonoscopies out of 10,000 colonoscopies can have post-colonoscopy bleeding. Most often than not, we do, the patient presents to the ER, we go back in, we repeat the test, and uh, we find the area bleeding, and we can stop it. The second risk I talk to my patients about is that of a perforation a hole or a tear in your colon. And again, that risk is higher if we have polyps that are very difficult to take out and we have challenges, your risk of ha having a perforation is much higher. Sometimes you have patients, as I described, that have restricted motility or part of the colon is fixated and we are having a difficult time going through with a colonoscopy. And in the process of trying to go through, that patient can have a perforation. The risk of a perforation in a colonoscopy is about four out of 10,000. So these are not big risks that we're talking about. The other thing we discuss is during a colonoscopy, you get medications. Just like with every other medication, people can have side effects from those medications. Sometimes a patient doesn't tolerate the medication where, and they have a deep in their breathing. They, they cannot breathe because maybe the medicines over relax them and they are no longer conscious so they cannot breathe. So those patients, we have to stop the procedure and try to get them back to breathe and sometimes we have to reverse the medication with another medicine. Patients' heart rate can go low and if it, imagine if it goes very low, some people can have a, a cardiac arrest and then we try to resuscitate. And as you know, not a lot of uh, people that have a cardiac arrest can be resuscitated. Me talking to you here, I've had a patient that arrested on me. It was due to massive bleeding. Fortunately, we were in the hospital. We called what we called the court. And people I came in quickly. And uh, the patient was saved. And she recovered without any complications. It wasn't even a colonoscopy. It was actually an upper endoscopy to go and, and stop bleeding in her stomach. But when we went in, the bleeding was just too much that we couldn't do much. And the patient arrested. She was bleeding. I saw her I'm oozing almost her, all, every pint of blood in her on me. And I knew things weren't going to go well. And she was, in fact, it was very emotional. And she kept crying. I'm dying. 
and die. It was a very frightening thing. And it was the first case I ever had that went through that. So it was very traumatic. <laughs> but I'm fortunate that we were able to resuscitate her and things went well. So again, these are some of the things you need to be aware of. And so can you die? Yeah, because of some of those things that I cited. When you have a perforation, you may end up having surgery. And you know the complications that can come with surgery. You can die. When you have a cardiac arrest, you may, we may not succeed to revive you. You're going to die. So, but is that risk significant enough for me to ask somebody not to get a colonoscopy? No. Go get your colonoscopy. I, I guess the question important. that uh, people listening to you now, they probably have is, Doc, with all this risk, I mean, one person dying is too many persons. I, I, we all agree on that. Are there things that if somebody had to come to you to do the procedure, you will advise him to do at home first, maybe eat certain things or maybe to avoid bleeding? What is it that is the re patient's responsibility before a colonoscopy procedure? Well, we, we generally, you know, uh, factors that, uh, determine colonoscopy or procedure complications, you can group them into patient-related factors and the procedure-related factors. Um, usually, we do a good job in identifying factors in patients that put them at increased risk of some of these complications. For example, if you have a cardiac condition such as atrial fibrillation, and you are taking a blood thinner. Depending on which blood thinner you are taking, we will recommend that the patient stops that medication a certain number of days before they come for their procedure. And usually when the patients come in, we will check their blood to make sure the blood is not too thin because of the blood thinning medicine they have. For example, if you're on Coumadin, you're on Zoroto. We, we don't check the blood for Zoroto, but we check for Kumadi and make sure that your, what we call the INR, is within an acceptable limit where your risk of bleeding is next to zero. So what we have, when we schedule you for a colonoscopy, we do a risk assessment based on your medical conditions and including what medications you're taking. And if you're on one of those, we will ask you to stop on a certain date, depending on which medication it is. So those are some of the things patients can do. A lot of people take baby aspirin. We never stop baby aspirin before a colonoscopy. So that's one thing the audience can walk away uh, from this discussion. But if you're taking a full dose aspirin, other known steroidal anti-inflammatory medications such as ibuprofen, Advil, Aleph, uh, Motrin, Excedrin, Naproxen, all these medications, then that also increases your risk of bleeding. Sometimes when the patient, uh, if you present and, uh, and you were taking some of these agents and you are ready for the procedure, we may go in just to see, because a lot of patients may not have polyps and then you've saved them another trip from coming back. But if I went in and I saw polyps, I'm not going to take them out. Because if I take on, take on that polyp, your risk of bleeding is very high, and we're going to be in trouble. So I'm not going to take on that risk. And sometimes when we detect patients that have had multiple surgeries, they've had difficult procedures in the past, we prefer not to do what we call moderate sedation. Because sedation for endoscopy you can either receive what we call moderate sedation. You are, you are conscious, but you are relaxed enough for the procedure. We can communicate with you. And some patients, we may not be able to get them to a point where we can do the procedure and they can fight with us. So those kinds of patients, we, can, we have factors that we can identify before the procedure and get them to get a deeper form of sedation, such as with an anesthesiologist. Well, I'm going to cut to you here. There's, there's a question. Um, um, viewers, if you have any question related to colonoscopy, whether prevention, treatment, whatever, please post them and 
I will get those questions transmitted to Dr. Um, uh, Dita, who is connecting uh, with us this evening from the great state of Minnesota. I have a question right here from Alain Lekubo, and I, I know doc, it's a medical doctor. Thank you for posting this question. Please post your questions. Um, even after the show, you can post your questions. Dr. Dita will go into the green room and um, provide you answers. Here is uh, the question from uh, Alain Lekubo. Dr. Dita, are there safer and cost-effective alternatives to colonoscopy? And I can understand why one would be asking for safer and cost-effective alternatives. Dr. Dita. Yeah, the, I mean, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, when we, we talked about the options for uh, screening, we, just thought, we spoke about the non-invasive stool-based testing options and we spoke about the endoscopic, which are invasive options. The last option was the virtual colonoscopy, or what we call a CT colonography. So the, again, I, I'll just review that. The stool-based uh, testing, yes. Is it safer? Yeah. When somebody is not going into you or doing an invasive procedure on you, the risk of bleeding or perforation are quite small. So that's an advantage for the stool-based testing. But remember, if you test positive, then you go for a colonoscopy. So it's a two-stage process. And some of these two base tests, you can do it, they do it annually. What we call the FICA immunohistochemical test, FIT, is done yearly. And there is a new testing, the DNA-based testing strategies. For example, what we call the ColoGuard is done every three years. And as I mentioned, it's a non-invasive strategy. You do it in the comfort of your home. They pose the key to your house. You can stool in the home, get the stool, put it in there, ship it back. They do the test, and they let you know, is it positive or negative? And then if it's positive, you will then go for testing. I must point out there are also a lot of false positives as well as false negatives. So those tests are effective but not as effective as having a colonoscopy. So we, pre we present all of these options to patients, and it's up to the patient to make a decision on what option they prefer. Yes, the non-invasive testing, I, I prefer it because maybe there are less complications, but I also accept that there is a higher chance that they can miss something. The colonoscopy was it's invasive, uh, privacy, somebody is going into me, uh, there's a risk of perforation, bleeding, uh, maybe I don't want it. Uh, or somebody say, I want it, and it goes for it. So it's up to the patient, and we present all these options which are approved in the United States to each and every one, and they make a decision on what option they want. I tell you, when you go to a doctor's office in the United States, I don't know how it obtains in London. Maybe I have to talk to Dorothy in Chamukong, who is thanking you, by the way, Gael and the rest, many people in London thanking you for coming on the show. I, I don't know what the procedure is in London, uh, but in the United States, after a doctor's visit and lab test, if the doctor tells you or ask the nurse to call you to his office, there's some trouble. It's not always good news that the doctor is inviting you to tell you. Um, I did myself, I did the non-invasive. I didn't ask, for, I mean, I didn't make the choice, but somehow my doctor thought that I should do that first. And the day I had to get my results, I was waiting if the nurse will call me over. The nurse did not call me, but told me, well, Divine, you can go online and look, see what your result is. I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a, a question uh, from Sean. He asked, what age, Dr. Dita, do you recommend for somebody to do colonoscopy? I'm sure he missed part of the program, but not, uh, the first part of the program, but no problem. You made it. Yeah. Again, uh, we classify patients based on risk. And the uh, majority of patients fall within what we call the average risk group. For every African American, or what we would describe non Hispanic black, you start screening colonoscopy at the age of 45. And for every other individual, 
Screening colonoscopy starts at the age of 50. Now, for example, divine, you had, a, you had testing. Let's say if you had a polyp that I will classify as the high risk polyp, which we discussed before. For example, you had a polyp that was greater than one centimeter. Or you had a polyp that showed under the microscope what we call high-grade dysplasia. Or you had what we call a tubulovillous polyp. That would imply that for your siblings, or what we describe as your first-degree relatives, they will start colon cancer screening at a different age, not the age that I cited for average risk. If you had any of those lesions that I just described, for example, and let's say you went in to get screening at the age of 45, all your first-degree relatives will start screening 10 years earlier than the age that you went in and you were found with that polyp. So if you went in at 45 and you had it, define when will your children start screening? Mm. They will start at the age of 35. Absolutely. If you went in and you were diagnosed at the age of 50, when will your children start screening? At the age of 40. If you were diagnosed at the age of 55, will your kids start screening at the age of 45? No. In this incident, they will start at the age of 40. So there are some mitigating factors that can determine whether I recommend an earlier colonoscopy based on your first degree relatives at an earlier age than I would have normally done. But the take home message here is simple. If you are an African American, you do not have any history of colon cancer in your family, and you do not have any of those risks that I described, those high risk polyps that I described, you start screening at the age of 45. If you are a, a non Hispanic white, you start at the age of 50. But if you have any of those factors, like there's a history of colon cancer in any of your parents less than the age of 60, or two of your parents have had colon cancer at any age, you start screening at, the, at 10 years earlier than the age where that person was diagnosed. If that age is earlier than 40, otherwise you start at the age of 40. Let me use an example. This is confusing. If my mom, if, if my first degree relative was diagnosed with colon cancer at the age of 55, and I'm an African-American, I was supposed to start cleaning at the age of 45. At what age am I going to start? At the age of 40. If my mom was diagnosed with colon cancer at the age of 40, at what age am I supposed to start screening? At the age of 30. And because of that risk in your family, you often, you often will start at 10 years younger than the age when that person was diagnosed, if that is younger than the age of 40. Again, this can be confusing. Uh, but if people have specific questions regarding their risk, they can post it, they can ask me, and I can address on an individual basis. And but I have, yes, and I have another question. Is there such, it's from uh, Likubo. Yeah, somebody says, well done, Dr. Dita, for those explanations. Honestly, I don't know how, I mean, I know that graduating from medical school, it's long years of labor, I mean, laborious training and reading volumes like what I see behind you there. I mean, because, I mean, you have all this information in your head. I just thought, I can't figure out how you guys handle this. Anyway, this is the question from Alan Likubo. Is there such thing as racial disparities in colon cancer? And how would you, and how would this affect 
you are practiced. Again, before you answer that, please, if you have any questions about colon cancer, anything about it, put ask the question now. It could become too late if you don't ask your question. That's why we bring people like Dr. Alain Likubo, Dr. Uh, Dita, and many other medical doctors to take your questions. Yes, Dr. Dita. Yeah, uh, Dr. Alain, thank you for uh, being on the show. Um, yes, uh, I'm sure the first part of the uh, uh, broadcast this night uh, contained a lot of information when we discussed uh, the epidemiology of colon cancer. We did note that we have, the, uh, it's, it's well known that there is racial disparities in the prevalence or incidence of colon cancer. And we noted that African Americans were at an increased risk of colon cancer compared to every other race or ethnicity. We also know that they develop colon cancer at an earlier age than the other ethnic, uh, 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 than the other groups, the other racial ethnic groups. That is the reason why today it is recommended that we African Americans start screening at the age of 45 as compared to every other race that starts at the age of 50. We also know that the reason why African Americans seem to have more aggressive disease diagnosed at a much later state, even at younger ages, is because of disparity in terms of socioeconomic status and the risk factors that we had earlier discussed here. Smoking, we spoke about you will note that the prevalence of smoking is relatively much higher in the African-American population. We talked about obesity. We talked about alcohol use. We talked about dietary factors, such as access to a fiber diet, such as vegetables, fruit consumption. So, the, the, so these socioeconomic and environmental dietary factors African Americans are at a disadvantage when it comes to these factors. And those are some of the reasons why they think that they come in, that they develop this disease earlier on than uh, their counterparts. We also know that access to health among African Americans is less. So they are not gaining, having enough access to preventive care. And they often show up late. And perhaps that can explain why they also have more advanced disease and therefore a higher mortality or less chance of having a curative therapy for their disease. So I hope uh, that uh, kind of answers your question. We also said men are at an increased risk. And that holds even within the different age groups as well as the different racial groups. This is Chat Night Africa Live, and uh, my name is uh, Divine Chiamakong. My host on the platform this evening is Dr. Ivo Dita, connecting from the state of Minnesota. The topic tonight is colon cancer, its complications, uh, diagnosis, science, and all kinds of stuff like that. So if I repeat this, if you have any questions related to colon cancer, please post the questions now and I will relay them to Dr. Dieter. Next Sunday, ladies take note, or if you're a man and you have daughters or you have a mother and you have sisters, take note. My guest next Sunday will be Dr. Adeline Nikuna. She'll be talking about complications in pre pregnancy. So if you have anybody likely to be pregnant, your mom, sister, children, you ought to Join us again next week for another edition of Chat Night Africa. Now, Dr. Dita, you sort of sounded like comforting to women. Uh, you say you, they're not so exposed to colon cancer as men are. Um, you want them to go home thinking, well, no problem now. At least this is something for men, not for us. 
Uh, that was certainly not the... How should they uh, react to your message? No, uh, <laughs> a good point. Uh, I don't want women to live for, uh, uh, from listening to me tonight and think that because men are more at risk, they are not at risk. No, that's not the message. Uh, what I was doing was discussing the epidemiology or what we know about the disease. The risk, even among women, is high enough that they stand to benefit just like the men. And as I noted before, some of the factors uh, that increase your risk, unfortunately, men are more exposed in the society to those. But it doesn't imply that a woman is not at risk. So I want every woman watching to remember what I said here tonight about screening. African Americans age 45. Any other race at the age of 50. And if your first degree relative has been diagnosed or, or, or has had polyps considered high risk, or they have developed colon cancer, you will need to start earlier on than the ages I just mentioned. So please, while the risk is higher among men, there is a significant risk in women. So go get your screening. Do not postpone. Go get it. And don't think that you, because he says African-American before, he said American, he said African. So if you're African, you, 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 you ought to be equally as concerned. Yes. Doctor, before we round off this show, any take home message, what would you want our numerous viewers take home? Uh, again, in, uh, in, just in summary form, of course. Yeah. So I, I, again, thank you uh, very much for this opportunity. I think this was a very uh, timely topic at the time. Uh, when uh, we are talking a lot about colon cancer screening. Uh, uh, just to summarize, uh, colon cancer is a major problem in the United States. And we know that uh, um, it's the third most commonly diagnosed uh, cancer. And it accounts for a significant proportion of mortality. The good news is that uh, colon cancer can be detected early or prevented by identifying the pre-cancer lesions, which is what we call polyps. I also want people to know that it is not because you are not having symptoms. That means you don't have a polyp. A majority of patients with polyps will have no symptoms. We know that polyps take about 10 years from onset to become a cancer. And they occur as we get older. So within that window, if you get uh, your screening procedure or your colonoscopy, that polyp will be identified and taken out and prevent you from developing a colon cancer. So do not sit and say, oh, I'm doing well. I have no symptom, no headache. Why should I go get the colonoscopy, get the screening? <laughs> Please do not regret. Don't wait and say, I wish I had known. Go get it when the time comes. If you do not like a colonoscopy because of some of the risk we discussed, you can get the non-invasive test options which are just tool-based, and you can mail the kit to your home. You can collect the stool, then mail it in, and wait for the results. But even though I said colon has some risk, colonoscopies have some risk, the risks are negligible. Me sitting here, I will go for my colonoscopy without any hesitancy. And as I speak to you, I do at least 12 colonoscopies on the days I'm doing colonoscopies. And I can tell you that for uh, since 2012 that I've been doing this, I've really not had uh, uh, the, all those major complications I spoke about. Maybe one or two cases, but that's really negligible for given the number of colonoscopies uh, that I have done. 
Doctor, I, I guess... have meat. I have red meat in my in my fridge. Should I throw it out? What should no, I do with that meat? Or no, if sir. I drained a little bit, in, if I drained a little bit, dry like we do back home, we dry the meat a little bit and yeah. drain the liquid out of it a little bit. Does it become a lot better since we love this meat? I have some in my fridge. I don't know what to do with it. Yes, I, I agree that if you were to do what we do, season it or dry it as we do back or bake it or something of that nature and take out the fat, the fatty content of it, because we know it's an animal fat content of what these foods that are, are, are certainly that we think increase your risk. So if you were to kind of do anything that drains out much of that, then you are in a better position. Again, is this risk big enough for, for, for the, the United States or her uh, departments to recommend that we shouldn't eat red meat? No. It's a small risk. So if you uh, eat your red meat, but remember what I told you today. If you go for screening, these lesions can be identified long before they become cancers, cancerous. I, I have a quick if question If you go here, at the right age. I have a question. I, I know we, I said we kind of uh, uh, rounding off on the show, but there's a question just came in. Is primordial prevention a realistic approach? And the sender says before we are born or in very early stage of life? I don't seem to understand the, the, the question. Is, uh, can you read it again? Uh, you say, is primordial, primordial prevention a realistic approach? Is she uh, talking about primary prevention, maybe? I think so. Okay. Well, I mean, again, the primary prevention, in, in medicine, we talk about health promotion, which will focus on things like you, uh, how do we manage those risk factors, then we move on to prevention, where we can perhaps detect things early before they become something else, and then curative or diagnostic when you have developed symptoms. Certainly, colon cancer, we, it's one of the most described and well-documented entity that prevention works. And we have data in the United States showing that there is a, a significant downtrend in the incidence of colon cancer due to the increase in uptake of screening. It has also been shown that because of the increase in uptake, cancers are being diagnosed at an earlier stage where you can get surgery and you are done and you are cured, as opposed to if you came later. So we know there is a sharp decline in the incidence of colon cancer, and there is a sharp decline in the mortality of colon cancer due to an increase in the uptake of screening for colon cancer. Again, there is still a lot of work to do in terms of increasing access, educating the population to get them coming earlier than they, than they are doing right now or to adhere to the current guidelines as it pertains to colon cancer screening. But certainly, screening for colon cancer has paid significant dividends in, as a whole from a medical perspective. And Dr. Dita, coming on Chat Night Africa to talk about this, pays significant dividends. Let me borrow that uh, statement phrase from you. Um, before you go, Dr. Dita, I'd like to inform our audience that next Sunday, same time, another medical doctor will be here. And that's because health is wealth. It's important that you know what's happening to your body how you expose yourself to attack before it gets too late. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. And the moment you stop learning, you start dying. That's why we do all the things we do. Next Sunday, complications of pregnancy. And my guest will be Dr. Adeline Nukunar. She'll be connecting remotely from the state of Delaware in the United States.
a last word, Dr. Odita, before the jingle goes on the air. Again, uh, Divine, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, gracias. Uh, mucho gusto. Adios. <laughs> You are something. You are something else. I didn't know you are so uh, fluent in Spanish. In Spanish, uh, thank you, Doctor Dita. Honestly, the very impressive thing about you is each time we come knocking, Doctor Lekuba Alain comes on. You coming on? I know how busy you doctors are, and still because of the importance of getting our folks staying healthy you put aside the myriad of things you have to do to come on Chad Night Africa. We cannot thank you enough. I mean, members of the audience, our viewers have been thanking you and sending you kudos and all kinds of stuff. If you like what you have been watching, share this video. Help somebody with it. Let's change the world. Let's be world changers. That begins by taking action. Now, we can sit and complain about calling, calling cancer or any other problem all day long. But we've got to do something about it, like Dr. Dita is doing something about it by keeping aside so many things. He, ought pro he probably will be eating some soya or barbecue. So <laughs> no, that's red meat again. Somewhere <laughs> in Minnesota. But he yeah. chooses to come on the show for the last one hour. Thank you, Dr. Dita. We really, really appreciate you. You are touching lives. Everybody's saying, excellent job. Great job. Great job, Dr. Dita. Thank you. Mucho gusto. Adios. This is not the last time you'll be coming back again for yet another edition of Chat Night Africa. And ladies and gentlemen, this is how we round off on the show. Your host has been Divine Chilamogong, my guest, Dr. Aibo Dita. That has been Chat Night Africa, live from Washington, D.C., metropolitan area. And on the show this uh, day, we were talking about uh, colon cancer, science and symptoms, complications. From Washington, D.C., metropolitan area. It's all right here. It's dynamite. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who was listening. Please share this video. I'm coming. I will be coming back again next I'm Sunday coming. for yet another instructive back. broadcast. I'm coming. Coming to get down. We're going to get down. We're going to get down. That night, Africa. We're going to get information with which We're you dance. weaponize yourself. We're going to Thank you guys, thank you guys. We don't say to the moon. I'm ready. I'm coming. Broadcast assistants, Edmarin YMD and John Santo Match Fire. Live from Bamenda. We're gonna dance. We're gonna party. If you know anybody who is taking lives, please let us know. We're gonna boogie. That's the kind of person we want on Chat Night of Collide. It's all right here. It's dynamite. I'm ready. I'm coming. Thank you, Dr. Lillian Danga. I'm ready. Say hi to Professor I'm ready. Keep down. Thank you to everybody. I'm ready. I love you so much. I'm coming. It feels like I shouldn't go. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm coming. I will come back again We're gonna next Sunday. We're gonna I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. This is not my last time on the show. I'm coming. You are I'm hosting my show. I'm coming. I'm coming to dance. We're going to dance. We're going to dance. We're going to dance. Thank you to everybody. Dance. I'll see you again. We're going to keep down. Bye bye. We're going to keep down.